I, I happen to live in a, in, in a house, uh, Erica and our girls, they all, um, they love, they love, 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 love music, okay? There is almost always something playing in our house um, when we're in the car. Um, it, a lot of times there's music on before I can even get in. It's just, it's going to be, if I would even think about being in the car with anybody in my family and doing something like listen to ESPN radio, I mean, I would be banished. I mean, it's, it's serious. Like that you just, it's going to be music. And if there's the millisecond of a commercial, it changes, right? There's lots of loud singing in our house and I love it. I'm, I'm all, I'm all for it. I, I love it. But what can happen on occasion, and you all know this, right? Like it's happened to all of us, is every now and then, you even you get a song, and even a good one, and it gets like stuck on play in your head, right? Anybody know not my thing, right? Like you just can't get a song out of your head. And it, it, it's like, you know it, and it was good. Like at one point, it was even your favorite song. And now you're just like, please, somebody open my brain and take it out, Right? It just becomes too much. It's just in there, and you can't make it stop, and it just, it's all the time. Like, so for so several years ago, um, I just felt like I was trapped in the movie Frozen. I, I mean, I just, everywhere I went, it just, there it was. Like, it was in my head, and like, I would get into a quiet room in our house, and there it would be, it's still in my head. The cold doesn't bother me anyway. And then I live on a day like today, and I'm like, oh, yes, it does, okay? And so it's just, but it was in there, and it's just, it's on rewind, and you, and you can't get it out, and you're trying to play other songs, and you're trying to change anything you possibly can, right? And it's one thing when it's music, because eventually we can listen to enough other things, or we can just make up our own song, or do whatever, and, and get the, the whole deal to shift. It's a little bit of a bigger challenge when it's our life, like when, when, our, when our life kind of, it gets a song, and it and it just, it gets stuck on, on play, and it just gets stuck on that loop, and it just keeps playing again, and it just keeps playing again. And for a lot of us, it's, it's sometimes, it's, it's even a good thing, like we have a, a milestone moment, or a monumental moment, or something, just it seems miraculous happens, and then that becomes the moment of our life, and that becomes the singular story of our life. Or it's something, it's something bad. There's a loss we had or a wound we had or an abuse we suffered, and, and we didn't really want it to be this way, but that then became our identity. That thing became our story. That became our song. And it's the only song we know how to play. It's the only song that we know the, the lyrics to. And, and again, we didn't necessarily want it to be that way, but now we've been in it so long, we're not real sure how to sing a different song. And yet, there's this, there's this little part of us that's like, I wish I had a different song. I, I wish I had a different song. See, even the best of moments, even the best of, of the best of the best, when they become the singular song of our life, even those moments, get a, they get a little stale. They, 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 they get a little old. The, the conversations we have when we talk about something good in our life, they always go back to the same story. They always go back to the same song. And there's something in us that says, now, wait a second. What, isn't there anything like a new song? Isn't there, isn't there something that, 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 that could be different? If our identity in our song became wrapped in something that, 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 that's a harder part of our life, we, we can even wrestle with, oh, but can I can I have a new song? Like, or am I supposed to like hold this one forever? And a lot of the inner turmoil stirs around. And yet here's this, here's this thing that, that's true about Jesus. It, it, it feels like a contradiction, and yet there's this remarkably beautiful truth about, about Jesus. And, and that is that, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the story of Jesus in the scriptures paints a picture of and tells us about a Jesus who is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And yet, one of the things that is always the same about Jesus is that he is always doing a new thing. Right? I, I know it's early and it's cold, but, it, 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 right? But just go there for a second, right? One of the things that's always the same is that he's always doing a new thing. One of, the, one of the most true things about Jesus is that he's always up to a new good thing in our life. Jesus doesn't have mercy that's new every morning because somehow the tank ran dry, ran dry the day before. Jesus has mercy that's new every morning because he constantly has new creative ways to express it. Jesus doesn't have new grace. He has constantly new expressions of grace. 
He has new ways to display his love. He has new ways to display his glory and his goodness. He has new ways to reveal his holiness and his bigness and his closeness. He's the same. He's always merciful, loving, kind, redeeming, transforming, and he keeps having new creative expressions of it in our life. He's the same and always doing something new. It's, I think it's part of what the psalmist kind of journaled about, prayed about, and what you and I have is Psalm 40 in the Old Testament of the Bible. This, this is what the psalmist said kind of on the heels of a really challenging time. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he, and he heard my cry. I was in this really challenging time. Like I'm just, I was kind of sitting in the, in the pit of all things. And I, but then I, I prayed and he lifted me out of this slimy, stuck pit that I couldn't get out of on my own. He lifted me out. He picked me up out of mud and mire. And then, then look at what it says. He says, he, he set my feet on, on a rock. What he did was he set my feet on something so stable. He put me on a very, very firm foundation. He gave me an anchored, stable place to stand. And I love what he says next. He says, he put a what? What are the next two words? He put a what? He put a what? Jesus is always about getting us to a firm place to stand, and he is always about giving us a new song. Those are always true. He put a new song in my mouth, this hymn of praise and celebration of who our God is. And as a result, many will see and they'll be in awe, not of me, but of the Jesus in me in this new ongoing, redemptive, restoring work he does in me. He will give me a new song. And here, here's what I want to say to some of you today at the very beginning thing. Is that some of us, we feel it. We feel a little bit of the, uh, of living on the same story. And we celebrate the story. We celebrate the goodness of God in our life. But when we tell that story, it doesn't even have the same life to us any, anymore. Some, somehow we don't want to say it, but on some level, it's, it's almost like it became stale. Some of us, we've, we've been in the same story for so long uh, that, that we've literally become identified and marked by a singular thing, and it's something that, that wasn't good and that we didn't sign up for and that we didn't want and we wouldn't have chosen, and yet we somehow that's what people always talk to us about, so that's what became our st story. It became our singular song, and we don't really like it that way. But, and there's this longing in us to say... Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. What's the, what's the fresh thing, the new song? What's, the, what's Jesus doing right now? And for some of, some of you today, the best, the most encouraging thing is that right now, whatever you're in, Jesus wants to start a new song in you today. Not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, not after this, not after that. Right now, Jesus would love nothing more than to start a new song in you, to put a new expression of his good in your life on display in your life. Jesus would love to let you, with the psalmist, say, holy cow, I don't even know if I can explain how Jesus did it, but he did it, and now I've got a new song. There's a new layer to my story of life with Jesus. Jesus wants to give you a new song. Listen, that wasn't for the psalmist alone. It's for you. It's for you. It's for your marriage, your story, your parenting, your job, your career, your health, your emotion. It's for you. Jesus wants to put a new song in your mouth, right? A new part of your story with him. But how does he do that? How does that even begin to take shape in us? How does that even get any traction? Well, in order to begin to see it a little bit, we're going to go back to a passage we've been in uh, during this month of January, John chapter 10, which is in the Newer Testament of the Bible. Psalms was, was a couple thousand years before that. And now we're going to go to John 10, it's page 732, if you want to use a, a, a Blue Worship Center Bible. And if you don't have a Bible and you grab one of these today, just take it with you, let it, let it be our gift to you. That's, that's great. 
And in John 10, now we're going to listen in on the words of Jesus while he talks to some, some people honestly who are really religious. They live in a good community and all those kind of good things, and, and yet they're missing what Jesus is actually up to. Then Jesus is trying to make it clear. He keeps coming back to it. There's some of Jesus' followers around who are really leaned in on what it means to follow him and grow in love for him. There's some curiosity seekers around wondering, oh, what's Jesus really up to? Who is this guy? And so he begins to paint a picture of who he is in relationship to us and who we can be in relationship to him. And in it, he, he kind of unveils for us some of how he puts a new song, some of how he makes us new, how he creates a new you, how he creates a new me. So let's just look at it. John chapter 10, we're going to start reading in verse 1. Here's what it says. Very truly, which is, is kind of Jesus' way of saying, hey, I, I'm really trying to get this through to you. I'm telling you, Pharisees, there's those religious leaders who, who are missing, they got a lot of rules, missing a lot of Jesus. Anyone who does not enter the, the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus, again, painting a picture. He's the shepherd. We're, we're the sheep, the ones that he's leading, we're following, he's guiding, and we're listening. And, but there's this thief, Satan, this very real enemy of Jesus, and that's the thief who's going to try and come in and very subtly and in very crafty ways can kind of dilute and steal our life little by little, sometimes steal it by giving us so much good we don't even know life is being stolen. And Jesus is, is kind of addressing that, trying to put that on the table. Verse 3, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. And Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees, they, they just didn't get it. They're just not hearing what Jesus is trying to say about loving, leading relationship with him. So verse 7, he says it again. Jesus says it again, which is what a picture of Jesus' patience, right? Uh, let me try this again, guys. Okay, I've been trying it for 10 chapters. Let me try it again, he says. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I I'm the gate for the sheep too. I I'm trying to tell you I'm the, sh the shepherd. You're not quite getting that one. Let me tell you, I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm the gate. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I'm the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved and be in relationship with me. They're going to come in and go out, and they're going to find pasture. They're going to find good places to experience life with me. But there really is this thief that comes in only to steal and kill and destroy life. But, but again, in contrast to that, I want you to know that I've come so that they, you, could have this fullness and vibrancy and depth of satisfaction of life and that you would have it so much that it literally just flows out of your life in ways that you can't contain, in ways that you wouldn't even fully be able to describe. He says, I do that because I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, and the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, this thief, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand. He doesn't care for the sheep. Jesus is saying, look, when push comes to shove, what happens is we kind of rely on the pattern of the world. And when things get hard, it's not, it's, it's, it's not really a supporting pattern. But when the world pushes in on us and life goes hard, it's she says, look, it's, that thing's not going to be there for you anymore, but I'm trying to be here for you. I'm trying to paint this picture of contrast. Now, I want to go back to verses 3 and 4, kind of back up towards the top of that. Hey, look at what Jesus says. He said, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. He's talking about the shepherd and the sheep. They listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. He's getting ready to lead them toward this pasture where they'll have enough to eat, they'll have enough to drink, where he can watch them, he can guard them, he can protect them when, when a lion or a wolf attacks. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. Okay, he's going to bring them out, and then he's going to go ahead of them. And his sheep will follow him because they know his voice. So he, here's, here's what Jesus is painting a picture of there. In the first century, the, the shepherd would come to the gate, and they would rattle the gate. They would start to make noise on the gate. they just rattle this, this little latch, and the sheep would start to, to stir. They'd start to hear it. And then the shepherd would start to call the sheep by name. Jesus is saying, look, I know everybody's name. I know all of you. And the shepherd would know all of his sheep, and he'd start calling Bob, Larry, Gertrude, Methuselah. I, mean, I don't know what their names were, but they had names, apparently, right? 
And so Jesus is calling them, and he's calling them by name. And here's what happened. All the sheep, they would have to come to the gate. They would start forming together, and they would come to the gate. And here's the thing. A really good shepherd would be standing at that gate. And on the way out, that shepherd would stop each sheep individually. And that shepherd would kneel down with that sheep, and they would begin to just kind of survey the condition of the sheep. They'd be looking inside the wool. They'd be checking under the ears. They, they would be looking. They would notice things like these really annoying bugs and insects that would burrow into the sheep and could create disease and could literally get in and drive the sheep, literally drive the sheep nuts until the sheep was then banging itself into rocks and self-harming. And, and so the, the shepherd would know, okay, look, if I see those, I've got just the right oil to take care of that. I've got just the right medicine. I'm going to treat that. I'm going to treat the wound and the disease the insect has left. I'm going to treat you for the insect. The shepherd would know where the sheep had been the day before and the risk and the dangers and the threats it had experienced. It would know where it laid down. It would know anything it had tripped in. The shepherd would know what enemy tried to sneak into the gate at night and it would know where to go to look for the wounds on that sheep and know which kind of oil does this wound need and which kind of treatment does this wound need. And it would literally stop at every sheep after it called it by name and say, okay, now look, just before we go out, I got really good things out there, but just before we go out, let me just take care of you a little bit here. I want you to go out with, with the medicine on. I want you to go out with some good things taking shape. And, and what Jesus is really painting this picture of, he says, I'm a, I'm a really good shepherd in part because I want to invite you into my healing. I want to invite you into my, into my healing. I'm not just trying to, to get you out to a pasture. I'm trying to invite you into my healing so that you can experience the goodness of the pasture. Jesus is saying, I'm going to slow this thing down long enough to say, oh, look, I know, I know, I see, ah, I know. I see the ravages of those bugs and those insects in life. I see the ravages of the wolf that jumped in and you got away, but man, it was close and twisted your ankle over here, your knee over here. I know. I've got something. I want to help you heal. She's saying, look, I, in, in order to fully live this life, I understand where you've been. I understand where I'm trying to lead you, and I understand the healing I want to give you along that way. And Jesus is really building on this, this thing that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. See, these, these sheep, they're surrendering to him. They're surrendering to the shepherd and saying, okay, look, I'm going to I'm gonna rest in your ability and your desire to lead me in a very, very loving way. They're following him and connecting. He's calling the sheep together, right? It's going to narrow at the gate. They're going to go one by one, but they've come to the gate together. They're going to go to the pasture together. She's saying, look, we're going, to, we're going to do this thing together. You're going to do it in the community of the sheep. You're going to do it in the community of the people. And I want you, not, I, I, I want you to know my healing. I want you to know my ability to give you a new song. I want you to know my ability to do a new thing in your life. I want you to know my ability and my desire to see where you've been, to understand your wound, to understand your pain, and to heal it, to meet you in it. But how does, like, how does, that, actually, how does that actually happen? Like, what, what, what takes shape? Well, here, here's what we got to... Russ, with at the very beginning, is that everything always begins with his presence. Everything always begins with his presence. Look, it's Jesus at the gate. It's Jesus at the gate. It's Jesus at the gate. The first move isn't self-care by the sheep. The first move isn't the care of somebody. It's Jesus. They're surrendering to Jesus' healing at the gate. It always starts with Jesus' presence. It always, the, Jesus is the one who has this, this ability and the fullness of this desire to bring the healing. It always starts with his presence. It's always him first, kneeling down, looking the sheep in the eye getting as close as possible to all the wounds and the dings and the nicks and the bites and the scrapes and the breaks. Saying, yep, I'm, I'm right here. Hey, before, before we go out there, before we go out there, let me, let me just start a healing thing here. You're going to limp a little bit out there still, but let me just start a healing thing here. It always starts with his presence. And when, we're, when we engage Jesus in his presence, what we find is he gives us the strength to go back. 
he gives us the strength to go back. Remember, he kind of knows where the sheep have been. He, he's, he's reminding them where they've been. You've been where these insects and these bugs are. You've been where there was an enemy. You've, been, you've lived a real life in the real world where there are things that are, that are poking at. You've been where you've been overlooked. You've been where you have been abused. You have been where you've made decisions you wish now you wouldn't have made. You have been abandoned and left behind. You have been caught in the guilt and the shame that came with that addiction. You have been caught in that addiction. I know where you've been. I know where you've been. And I want to give the strength to go back and actually talk about it. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, who is um, who's a Jesus-following neurologist, she talks about uh, the things that Jesus has done to create us so our brains can actually rewire a little bit and form new pathways of, of thought. And one of the things that she talks about is, is our tendency to say like positive things and make positive statements and even quote scripture, all of which are really, really good. That, that's great, right? But she says oftentimes why there's a gap between us doing that and us experiencing what we think should be the benefit of it is because we haven't actually gone back to fully really identify what's the pain I'm actually trying to heal. We're just throwing things at the wall, hoping something sticks. We're doing a really good thing, but we haven't gone back to say, what's the real hole, the real wound, the real pain that I'm hoping actually is medicated by the things that I'm saying, the scripture that I'm quoting, the st- what's really happening there? Jesus, look, we're going to slow down long enough that we can actually talk about what the real pain really is. Instead, often we, we kind of respond like we did when we were kids, right? Maybe you're a parent or you've worked in daycare or something, been around kids or whatever, and they fall and they scrape something, right? You know, they, they scrape the knee, they scrape the elbow, whatever it is, right? And they come running in, screaming bloody murder, right? There's been a minor abrasion and the world is pivoting, okay? And there's tears and there's a couple drops of blood, or, okay? And what happens is, they're screaming and they're yelling and they just can't barely catch their breath. And, and it takes a minute to actually slow it down long enough to get back to what actually happened. Like, did, where did you fall? How, how did you fall? What, what, were, what were you doing? I mean, it might only take a Dora Band-Aid to fix this thing. But can we talk about how we got there, right? Like what, right? And Jesus just slows it down long enough to say, hey, you know what? I don't want to invite you into my healing, but I, I, know, I, know where you, I know where you've been. I know how you got that mark. I know how you got that wound. I, I know what left that in your soul. I know. I know. And I want you to know. Because when, when we do, we're even, we're even more captured, we're even more amazed at the layers at which Jesus will tackle in order to act, bring us healing. When we... When we start with Jesus' presence, he gives us the strength to, to go back, but, but not to live there. See, some of us going back, that's become our song. We're, we, we've got a one-song story. It's back. It's what happened to us, what happened because of us, what we did, what somebody else did. That's, that becomes our, our story. That becomes our song. And while Jesus' presence gives us the strength to go back, it also gives us hope for the future. See, Jesus has already painted this picture. I'm still leading you somewhere. I still have pasture out here. We're still going. We're not going to stay at the gate and talk about medicine for all the days of your life. I'm going to begin this healing journey in you, and then we're going to travel to the pasture together. We're actually going to go do this thing together. We're not going to stop. We're not going to remain stationary. We're not going to stay here at the gate until everything is perfect. I'm going to start a really good healing work in you. You're going to be reminded of how much I love you, and I'm going to keep leading you to good things. Jesus always gives us some hope of the future. And here's the challenge. The life we live in the pattern of the world picks one of those. I'm going to have the strength to go back, but then I'm going to live there. I'm going to live only identified by what has happened in my life. Or I'm going to ignore that and I'm just going to have hope for the future. That never really happened. It doesn't really affect me. I've just put my head down and pushed on. And this is all I really have is hope for the future. And Jesus is like, oh man, wait. Part of what will be amazing about my love for you is I'm going to put those together. Jesus' presence actually gives us at the same time strength to go back and hope for the future. Jesus' presence at the very same time gives us strength to go back and hope for the future. 
a handful of years ago, um, Eric and I found ourselves in a, in a counselor's office, and we kind of had this, this, uh, this, found ourselves in this crisis moment. And so we're, we're sitting there, and we're kind of, we're unpacking it, right? He creates this safe space for us to have the strength to, to, to go back. And I still remember, like a ways into that session, after we've unpacked the story, I still remember him painting a picture of what had happened to us and what we were in that was completely different than anything I'd ever considered. And to be honest, I wasn't going to consider it. I had a hard time considering after he said it. But what, what happened in the strength to go back, it, 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 gave the clarity, it gave the clarity of the wound. It gave the clarity of the wound that was still taking place. It was still happening. And when we could see it for what it really was, there was this whole new hope for the future because we knew what we were actually going after. We knew what we were actually dealing with. We knew what was actually on the table. We knew what it was that was causing the pain. That's part of the gift of Jesus. He, he merges this strength to go back with this, this hope for the future, Jesus has this ability to sit with us in our pain while still holding our divine potential for the future. See, right now, there's a whole bunch of us in the room. We're sitting in our pain. The pain of what happened to us, the pain of what we did, the pain of what we wish would have happened, the regret of something we didn't pursue, the decision we made we wish we wouldn't have, we're sitting in the middle of that pain. And, and here's what's happening is, as Jesus is meeting us at the gate, and he's down, just, he's looking at us right now. He's just knelt down and said, hey, come on, come on, I know. And I'm going to sit with you in your pain. And while we're sitting in this pain, and while we're really going back and identifying the wound, I just want you to know that, man, I'm still holding really closely the hope of your divine potential. I'm going to sit with you in your pain, and I'm going to treasure and protect the hope of your potential. I still have good pasture. We're still going there. And you might limp for a little bit on the way and while we're there and you might have to wrestle with some of that, but I, I got them both. I got them both. And the question for us, the question for us becomes not, not just how do we get a new song, like how does something new start? How the, the question for us becomes what is Jesus inviting us to, to go back and really actually hear and find what the real issue really is. See, part of the reason some of us keep playing the same song is because we won't go back and address what the real issue really is, and so we keep coming back to it, and we wonder, like, why is this constantly remaining true about my life? Why won't this cycle break? Why won't it change? And we've danced all around the issues, and we've tried to add some band-aids to it, and Jesus saying, let's go back, let's go back, look, let's go back. I want to give you the strength to go back. And as a really good shepherd, I, I want to help you see that I'm, that I'm going to put some healing oil right in the source of that wound. Because you're, you're going to need that to fully live the hope I have for your future, to fully experience the divine potential that I'm still holding for you and guiding you towards and leading you towards. So the question really is, where today do we just need to receive his strength to, to go back so we can receive his hope? For the future. And I want to give us an opportunity just to sit in it for a little bit, to kind of walk in it, to make a move with Jesus, to actually engage his presence, the very real person of Jesus. Not an idea of Jesus, not a theory about the person of Jesus today.